Good afternoon, um, and welcome to the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. I'm Lynn Markey, and I am with the Coalition for Life Sciences, which is pleased to host our um, monthly Congressional Biomedical Research Caucuses. Um, and we'd like to also thank our chairs of the caucus, who's um, Congressman Rush Holt from New Jersey, Congressman Mike Castle from Delaware, and Congressman Brian Bilbray from California. Um, without them, this could not take place, so we're very grateful for their involvement and participation. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Wendell Lim. He is currently a professor in the Departments of Pharmacology and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Francisco, and also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's a native of Chicago, and Dr. Lim received his A.B. in chemistry at Harvard, um, his Ph.D. in biochemistry and biophysical biophysics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and completed his postdoctoral research in molecular biophysics at Yale University. Um, he is here today to talk with you about the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. Um, he got involved with this um, through his own experiences as a high school student, where he was a Westinghouse Science Talent Search finalist. And I think today they're called the Intel Science, correct? Yeah, um, one, of our, one of the CLS member groups is actually very strongly involved in that. Um, Dr. Lim recently started a partnership between University of California, San Francisco, and Lincoln High School, a, which is a San Francisco public school, in which a team of high school students working with scientists, scientific mentors are challenged to develop their own summer projects in synthetic biology and compete in this annual competition held at MIT, which I understand will be held in November of this year. So um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lim, and he can explain this much more eloquently than I'm doing right now. So thank you. OK, well, it's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be able to speak to you today. Um, <clears throat> So, so for most of my uh, adult life, I've been dedicated myself to trying to push forward the frontiers of scientific research. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is not my own research, but rather a different kind of experiment that I've been involved in for the last three years or so, um, which is an experiment to see whether or not kids from an average American high school can do science. And what I mean by that is not whether um, they can take courses and take exams and do the lab courses, but rather, can you take a bunch of kids put them in a modern, cutting-edge scientific laboratory, and can they actually make meaningful contributions to scientific research? And so I hope that uh, uh, you'll agree with me after you hear our story that the answer is a resounding yes, and I hope that we can discuss um, ways in which we can uh, nurture and develop and harness the incredible potential of our young people. So I'd like to start my story in uh, the city of San Francisco, uh, with uh, Abraham Lincoln High School. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to go back to November 2007. And this was a very good year for Lincoln High School. First of all, led by a devastating rushing attack and a uh, tenacious defense, Lincoln defeated its crosstown rival, Washington High School, 49 to nothing, to win its third straight city football championship. Despite the success of the Lincoln football team, however, the uh, it was a different team from Lincoln that actually made the biggest splash and landed on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. So this team of Lincoln students uh, was uh, a group that had taken uh, a unique biotechnology course that's offered at Lincoln High School. And what they had done is formed a team and participated in this competition held at MIT every year called the iGen competition, which is sort of a biotechnology Olympics. What was unique about this team, and it was sponsored by my institution, uh, University of California, San Francisco, uh, and I was the, the faculty advisor, was that um, <clears throat> there were 54 teams that participated this year uh, from all around the world and from all the best colleges uh, in the, the nation and, and, and the rest of the world. So this competition was primarily was designed for undergraduates, but our team was the only high school team to participate. The reason that they made such a big splash was because after all the presentations, presentations were made uh, and after the judging was done, six finalists were chosen from the competition. As you can see, one of these was Lincoln High School. Um, so we made it to the top six. Um, and uh, as you, you can note, most of the teams that won 
were actually from outside the U.S. Two were from China and two were from Europe. There was only one other school uh, from the U.S. that was UC Berkeley. So what everyone wanted to know was how did a bunch of high school kids beat out Harvard and, and the rest of the world and all the best colleges around the world? And so I'd like to show you a uh, video. Oh, we should plug that in. Uh, Okay, hey everyone, my name is Lauren Jan, and I recently graduated from Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco. This summer, I was part of the UCSF iGEM team. Now, UCSF is a research institution that has no undergraduate programs. So, they partnered with my high school, Palo Alto High, and UC Berkeley to form the UCSF iGEM team. They were willing to take a risk. motivated the whole way. Sometimes your lab will work, sometimes it won't work. For me, it didn't work a lot of the time, but I just told myself I have to stay motivated and no matter what happens, I have to just keep trying and sooner or later that something good will happen and through time, stuff just kept piecing together. I think you learned one of the most important things about science there. You really have to be able to deal with a lot of, no, that's not it, what next? You really have to be able to pick yourself up uh, from failure because Research is hard. I was actually looking the other day for, uh, I guess, positions at different labs. And so I got in contact with a Caltech professor. I told her, my name is Robert. I go to City College of San Francisco. And I showed her the newspaper article that uh, the IGMT was featured in. I showed her the New York Times article that this class was featured in. And she was, she was really impressed with the work that I've done at UCSF and, and especially impressed with the work that you guys are doing in this class. She told me about three days later that I had made the Caltech hygiene suit. And really, once you get your foot in the door, opportunities will just come right open. It was a chance for me to challenge myself to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I can honestly say that right now, I want to go into research. I want to do more lab work just because the experience I had was so fun. They gave up their whole summer, went full time. And everyone who took a risk ended up getting a reward way beyond what we expected. So I'm delighted that they want us back again this year. Okay, so uh, as you can see, it was a really inspiring experience. Um, but obviously, one of the questions is, why should we care at a, at a bigger level about um, this, this, what this group of kids accomplished? I think you'll all agree that, that um, in, the, in the bigger picture of things, the question of how we engage kids in science is intimately linked to these very important questions. How we train the next generation of scientific leaders in this country. Also, how we foster innovation and in the application of science. Uh, we all know that, that in today's world, um, there are many urgent global challenges that science needs to try to help address. We have issues with health care, with a growing world population, with an aging population here. We need better, uh, cheaper health care. Uh, with the way that we use energy, we need new sources of clean and sustainable energy. We need to be better stewards of the environment and uh, prevent problems like global warming. Uh, we also need to provide sufficient food for a growing population. And what many of us believe is that the life sciences are uniquely positioned to play a huge role in the, in the coming decades in addressing these challenges. In addition, uh, we all know that we live in a much more competitive world now, uh, as noted by the National Academy in their uh, Gathering Storm report, as well as by commentators like Thomas Friedman. There's increasing global competition, and there's really a, the great potential for loss of what has been decades of U.S. leadership in scientific discovery and innovation. As noted by President Obama in his, his recent address to the National Academy this year, he stated, our students are outperformed in math and science by their peers in Singapore, Japan, England, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, and Korea, among others. Another assessment shows American 15-year-olds ranked 25th in math and 21st in science when compared to nations around the world. And we know that the nation that out-educates us today will out-compete us tomorrow. So these are urgent issues, I think, 
And what I'd like to argue is that programs like iGEM at least give us a, a vision of potential ways that we can help address this critical set of problems. So I'd like to step back and introduce iGEM to you. What, what is iGEM? So iGEM stands for the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. And what it is, is it's essentially modeled after the uh, robotic design competitions that are popular in engineering. But in this case, instead of using mechanical and electronic parts to try to build robots that perform specific tasks, what the kids do is they use molecular or genetic parts to try to design biological systems that will carry out new and useful functions. So this is part of this emerging field, a uh, very exciting new field known as synthetic biology. And really, it's, it's trying to look at biology the way that a computer engineer might and trying to harness the power of biology to solve problems. So the way iGEM works is that over the summer, teams of students uh, get together and develop and execute their own project. They work very hard over the summer. And then in November, there's a, the iGEM Jamboree, which is held at MIT. Uh, here they present their work, and then they vie for top prizes. So iGEM is really only a few years old. It started in 2003. It was initially just a class that was held at MIT during an intercession period. Uh, but then 2004, uh, there was the first open competition. There were only four teams that participated, all from the US. But then with every year, more and more teams started participating, including many uh, teams from outside of the US. So in 2008, there were 84 teams from 21 countries. Uh, and this year, we're expecting there to be 112 teams participating. So if you went to the iGEM Jamboree, what would you see? Well, first of all, I hope that video that I showed captures the incredible energy that you would experience there of these bright kids really excited about what they're doing. What you'd see is you'd hear um, a, a bunch of highly polished presentations about very sophisticated scientific projects that really rival what goes on at the leading academic research institutions as well as uh, top biotechnology companies. But where the kids in iGEM actually exceed what you see in biotech companies or in um, the research community is that the ideas that they come up with are really much more innovative and creative than what you see typically. And that's in part because these young kids are, are, are young enough and inexperienced enough to not know the difference between what one considers possible or impossible. So they're bold enough to think about things really outside the box uh, and to be really innovative. And I can't really go over all of the ideas that come out of iGEM, but I just list a few of them. Uh, one team uh, developed a bacteria that could, uh, modified bacteria that could function as a, uh, a blood substitute. Another team came up with the idea of developing a microbial arsenic sensor that could be used in a very cheap way to sense the quality of, of say, drinking water. Uh, another project, which I will talk about a little bit more, is the idea to actually develop or build a new organelle with inside a cell. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that's uh, interesting and useful. <clears throat> so uh, for all of us that have been involved in iGEM, I think we, what we've really learned is that nothing motivates and focuses kids more than really challenging them and giving them the responsibility to tackle real problems. They also love working as teams. This is something that's not really traditional in modern biological research, but uh, is growing in importance. And, and the, the kids really love working as this team. Uh, in addition, obviously, having the competition and the element of competition really adds to this. And overall, it really just makes it a lot of fun. And so really what we learn is just the kids are like any other human being. Uh, if you give them, treat them with respect, uh, and engage them with the opportunity to really contribute, they really engage and, and do a great job. So I'd like to step back and talk a little bit about how we actually got involved in this at UCSF and how we established this relationship with Lincoln High School. So <clears throat> um, UCSF is part of the, the University of California system, but it's unusual in that it's a medical school only. So we actually don't have undergraduates. We have prof professional school students, medical, dental, et cetera, as well as graduate students. But we don't have undergrads. So although there are a number of us who are involved in the field of synthetic biology, it's actually uh, been quite a challenge to put together a team to participate in iGEM. And so over the years, uh, we cobbled together a team of a few uh, summer undergraduate or, or high school students that were working uh, in various other programs uh, and put together um, uh, small iGEM teams. Uh, so in 2007, one of my colleagues asked me to take over the team. I actually hadn't been involved uh, previously, and I was a, a little bit um, 
uh, uncertain about whether to do this. But then I decided to, to take it on. And what I just thought was uh, I came up with the idea that maybe we could uh, talk to various high school teachers in the city and try to cobble together some sort of uh, all-star team of great science students that, that came from different schools. So I called a lot of the uh, high school science teachers, tried to get, get numbers, and not that many actually called me back. Um, but luckily, um, a friend of mine who works at the, uh, the office in which uh, we have a partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District told me, you know, there's this really special teacher uh, at Lincoln High School uh, that you should talk to. His name is George Kachianis. So I got to know George. George is a very uh, inspiring teacher. Turns out that George was a um, scientist at Genentech prior to, to, to being a teacher. But in 1995, he decided to change his career and become a high school teacher. He joined the faculty at Lincoln High School. And he started what, what at the time was one of the first biotechnology classes uh, uh, in, 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 in the country. So. Um, <clears throat> What, uh, I talked to George, and he, uh, uh, he was very excited, and so we decided to put together a team. He selected some t five of his top students uh, to come to, to UCSF and, and become our iGEM team. So we invited these students to come. And I must admit that when uh, the day before that they, they came, I was uh, beset by fears that this would turn out to be a disaster. What would it be like to, to unleash five high school students in the lab. We have a lot of expensive equipment. We have a lot of people you know, doing important research. Um, what would happen? And in reality, these fears were, were misplaced because the kids were incredible. They worked really hard. They worked late into the night. Uh, they were as skilled as the graduate students uh, in terms of their work at the bench. And they provided this infectious enthusiasm that really uh, affected everyone in the lab and everyone around them. So in 2007, this first year, what really struck us was their creativity. Um, so the project that they, they worked on was the idea to design a new organelle. We had spent a lot of time telling, talking to them about how cells are organized and how there are different compartments in cells, like the mitochondria, that do carry out specific functions. And during one of these discussions, one of the kids said, why don't we try to build our own organelle, okay, a different organelle? And the reason that this is interesting is that one of the the uh, major goals in synthetic biology is to be able to harness cells, say like microbes like yeast, to produce biofuels or drugs that are difficult to produce. Um, the problem with doing this is that a lot of times you do this and you introduce new pathways and uh, they can be very inefficient and they can also, uh, products can be toxic to the cell. So the idea of housing uh, this sort of synthetic pathway in a separate organelle is very, very attractive. So we discussed how organelles are, are, are made in the cell, and um, uh, they came up with a great plan and got really amazing preliminary results um, about designing a novel organelle. And one thing I want to point out is that this project is actually still an ongoing project in my lab that a postdoctoral scholar is working on. So it really evolved into a serious research project. So overall, there have been a lot of different impacts um, of this program. In the schools, first of all, the experience of the iGEM team and the, and the, the, uh, uh, the story of how they did uh, at the Jamboree has been ex extremely inspiring to other kids. Uh, it's, particularly at Lincoln, it's increased the enrollment in the biotechnology uh, classes. Uh, now there are almost 200 kids a year who take biotechnology there. Uh, it's also affected uh, biotechnology programs at other San Francisco schools. The, uh, <clears throat> Several of the alumni who participated in our team have gone on to join or form new teams. You heard Robert Ovidia, who went on to, to join the Caltech uh, uh, iGEM team. But also former members of our team have now started iGEM teams at UC Davis, as well as at the City College of San Francisco. <clears throat> in addition, in the iGEM program overall uh, across the world, we see more and more high schoolers being a part of iGEM teams, as well as now, I think, several other all high school teams. Now, the impact has not just been on the kids, but it's also been on the lab and the scientists that, that mentored them. Uh, the iGEM alumni, several of them have become key members of our own research team. They've continued working in our lab. Um, some of the ideas that have emerged from iGEM have evolved into real projects, as I told you before. In addition, the iGEM experience has really energized and inspired many of the scientists' mentors uh, who have worked with the kids uh, about the importance of education and working with these young students. So really, the big point I want to make is that this is a two-way street, that not only have we 
given these kids a great opportunity, but the kids and involving them have brought this new energy, a lot of ideas, and, and, and really affected um, my own lab and myself. So uh, now this is our, 2009 is our third year. Um, yes, and uh, here's a, a recent uh, news story that was aired last week. For most high school students, wrapping their minds around the basics of chemistry and biology is a terrific accomplishment. But for a small group of graduating seniors here in the Bay Area, that's only the beginning. They're already working in the world of advanced bioscience. With a lab full of teenagers, this could be any afternoon chemistry class, but maybe a tad more sophisticated than most. So what the kids are working on now is um, a project to try to uh, reprogram cells um, to, to combat disease. If you don't remember working on that one in high school, don't feel too bad. These seniors from San Francisco's Lincoln High have been chosen for the prestigious iGEM competition, usually reserved for college students. Their team is spending the summer working at QB3, UCSF's Center for Quantitative Biosciences at Mission Bay. Okay, so we're going to count some cells, so make sure we sterilize it. Their project involves tweaking the behavior of blood cells to make them behave something like biological robots. Notice the cells on the left are not attracted to a chemical being injected into the dish, while those on the right have been programmed to home in on it. The idea is to ultimately create cells that could be used to distribute drugs to specific parts of the body or to target tumors. And that's kind of what synthetic biology is about. You engineer these cells to, or a living system to function, you know, the way you want them to. And maybe whatever you find out, you can apply it to something that will be beneficial. QB3 researcher Wendell Lim is overseeing the work, but says the students are completely responsible for generating the ideas and executing them. Uh, and so we've asked them, uh, how would you take a cell and how would you change the steering of that cell? How would you um, build a braking system? How would you build an accelerator for that cell? And uh, the kids have come up with a bunch of ideas and we're now trying, trying them out experimentally. The students will take their bioengineered cells to the iGEM competition at MIT this fall. But their instructor at Lincoln says the program is already having a profound effect back at their old high school. We started with just one class of 30 students in 1995 and now we have 150 to 180 students taking biotechnology at Lincoln every year. Every single one of them wants to get onto the iGEM team but only six or seven will. Now, the iGEM competition will take place from October 30th to November 2nd. We, of course, will keep you posted on how the Lincoln High QB3 team does. So in this year's team, we have seven Lincoln High School students. So these are selected from George Kachianis' uh, second year biotechnology program. This, his program has now evolved to have two years as an advanced course. So all of these guys have been through two years of biotechnology. Uh, We've also uh, gotten into the tradition of inviting back uh, at least two of the previous alumni uh, who are now undergraduate students who come in and play really a key role as, as kind of mid-level mentors for the, uh, the high school students. In addition, because iGEM is really such an international experience with all these teams from around the country, we've also instituted an exchange program. So we have two international students, one from Beijing and one from Slovenia, who are uh, on our team. In addition, a new element is that we've introduced... Uh, we've invited a, a middle school science teacher who is participating as a member of the team and is also trying to develop curricula based on our project. Uh, another key element of the team, of course, are the scientists. There are seven scientist buddies, grad students or postdoctoral scholars, um, who serve as one-on-one -on -one mentors for the individual high school students, and they're an absolutely essential part of this team. So the way our, our program works now uh, is that... Um, after the, the, these are all senior students, so after they've graduated, at the beginning of the summer, although they've had all this experience in the classroom, they're still very green, uh, and so we, we've developed this boot camp where we spend two weeks reading papers with them, having lots of discussions, and really trying to get them up to speed on, on cutting-edge research in this area. Uh, after that, uh, we spend quite a bit of time uh, brainstorming. We have these two-day uh, team challenge sessions where kids... Uh, the kids try to come up with uh, ideas of what we'll do. This is really where they develop their own ideas, and this is really what makes this program different from a lot of other research experience programs for both uh, high schoolers and undergrads, in that they can really take ownership of this project. They're, they're not being told what to do. They're not being handed a protocol or a lab manual. 
uh, and just sort of being plugged into the system. And so uh, this really energizes them when they, they have this kind of ownership. So then after that, uh, we hit the bench. Uh, there's not really a lot of time over the summer. The summer is short. Uh, they break into teams, and they race to get results before the jamboree in the fall. And so that's where we are right now. The, uh, <clears throat> this program really is an intimate partnership between three different players. We have the kids, but then we also have uh, the teachers, the, the teachers at, at Lincoln, as well as the teachers that participate in our team, and the, the professional scientists. So this is a, a short video that just talks about the different experiences for these different players. Hello, I'm, I'm Oliver. I'm co-directing this year's iGEM program here at UCSF. And I've got this rare opportunity to oversee these amazing students and see how they, how they pick up all this knowledge and take it on and come up with their own ideas to make things actually happen. Um, for me, it's a quite unique opportunity to get to get into mentoring and to to see something see a project evolve in quite a, quite a quite rapid pace in a short period of time. So I'm very happy to be involved. Draw two different I'm part of the UCS Agent team of 2009, and this experience is really good because although in class we learn we learn a lot of stuff, uh, we actually get to apply it here, and we get to become more independent, and we can actually do research on our own if they throw us something and say like, uh, I want you to get this gene in here, then we actually know how to figure out and do it ourselves. And this is really something that kids our age really don't get to experience much, or not really at all that I know of. So we're pretty fortunate, and it helps us confirm our career choices and gives us an insight into what we would be doing if we were going to get into this field. Um, do you think it's made you rethink like how science is done or made you think about it differently? Um, yeah, it showed me, like, I didn't really know how they would come up with these con like constructs, I guess. Um, so I learned about how they came up with their ideas, kind of, and how they would go about implementing it. I'm a teacher intern at Lim Lab this summer. I teach middle school science at the Friends School in San Francisco, and I'm very excited for this opportunity because I get to learn about what scientists are doing and bring that into my classroom and create curriculum that other teachers might be able to use. Um, it's a great opportunity for any teacher, uh, any science teacher, and I hope uh, more teachers are able to take advantage of it. Uh, doing this is helping me become a better teacher, and hopefully that will encourage more of my students to uh, become scientists, get interested in science, and think about something that they want to do with their life. So I want to talk a little bit more about the perspective of, of myself and the other professional scientists that are involved in this program. And the problem that... that, that I faced when I got involved in this and that, that most of the other scientists that get involved in this sort of thing is that is the question of whether scientific education uh, can really be aligned with scientific research. Uh, most of us, as I said, dedicate our lives to really trying to push forward science, doing real research and trying to, to push forward uh, scientific advancement. Uh, and though many people, scientists, view obviously educational outreach as being important, uh, fundamentally important, it's often viewed as a sacrifice, uh, a noble sacrifice or a distraction uh, from the, the, the major goal of pushing forward research. And so uh, what, uh, I think one of the things that I've really learned from the iGEM program is that actually it is possible to align the goals of scientific education and research under the right circumstances. I think the problem is that even with uh, amazing programs like the Lincoln one, a high school education uh, provides you a certain uh, body of knowledge, but there's a gap between that body of knowledge and what you need to really contribute to research and to actually also appreciate um, how fun and exciting research is, how exciting it is not just to learn about things that other people have discovered or invented, but rather to discover new knowledge yourself uh, or to invent things that have never been done before. So how do we bridge this gap? 
And I think what we've learned in this particular case is that obviously one of the key components are better teachers, particularly teachers who have a working knowledge of the practice of science. And that's something that George Kashianis, having worked at Genentech, really brings to the table. In addition, we need scientists who are uh, willing and able to reach out and develop these kids and tap their power. And if there's a partnership that develops that really, uh, with teachers and scientists working together, we can bridge that gap and really unleash the potential of the, the kids. Uh, so I think what we need is we need uh, more teachers that, again, have this working knowledge of what science is really like, not just in the classroom, but what a real working scientist in a, in a, a university or a biotech company uh, does. We need curricula and programs like the iGEM program that, that really challenge the kids, give them responsibility, give them excitement, and, and really give them a flavor of what it's like to start a project, to think it up, to, to design it, and to execute it. Something where they really understand why it's worthwhile and why it's exciting to go into a career in science. We also need to encourage practicing scientists to incorporate younger students into real research teams uh, and to form close partnerships with educators. I think that I've been very lucky to be able to form this partnership with Lincoln and George Kashianis. Okay. So I think, again, the answer uh, to the initial question is yes, kids can do real science. They can make real contributions to research if we prepare them and we challenge them in the right way. And I think this goes to a point that, again, President Obama uh, discussed in his uh, address to the National Academy uh, this spring, where he said, America's young people will rise to the challenge if given the opportunity, if called upon to join a cause larger than themselves. So I want to persuade you to spend time in the classroom talking and showing young people what it is that your work can mean and what it means to you. I want to encourage you to participate in programs to allow students to get a degree in, in science fields and a teaching certificate at the same time. I want us to think about new and creative ways to engage young people in science and engineering, whether it's science festivals, robotics competitions, fairs that encourage young people to create and build and invent, to be makers of things, not just consumers of things. So um, that ends my presentation. If you'd like uh, more information, uh, you can go to these websites that, uh, uh, about our, our iGEM team, the iGEM program in general, uh, about some of the research uh, institution, uh, centers that I'm involved in that are uh, carrying out research in synthetic biology, uh, as, as well as our lab site. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Talking about a change, you know, in sort of like better teachers, you know, scientists who reach out, but institutionally, like how much do institutions really value that kind of partnership in, say, giving you a, I mean, thinking from like a, an employee perspective, yes. kind of like to become a professor or to, to get tenure or something like that, are people encouraged really to, or is this valued in, in, in their career ladder, right. you know, as part well, of institutions? I mean, I think that's, that's a great question, and there, is no, there isn't a clear answer. It's, it's, I think, you know, at some level it's valued, it's obviously, but it, it still has that element of being kind of more of a noble sacrifice. Um, I think that, uh, and, and you, you raise the, the good point that it's not just the institution's resources, but also each individual scientist's career development. They need to publish their papers and, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's what, what uh, and, and that's particularly challenging in today's world where, for example, the University of California is undergoing extraordinary budget cuts, and so the first things to go tend to be these things. I, I think that, um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, what I'd really like to, to, to see is more, uh, I think the kids really do have a lot to offer, uh, and that uh, if it's done right, they can actually help push forward research and can be a great asset to, say, a postdoctoral scientist who really works with them and then harnesses their power. Uh, the other thing is I think that um, uh, if there's one place that uh, the government should invest, this is one of those areas. And how do you make it easier for a scientist to participate in this kind of program? Um, how do you make it so it's less of a burden so that they can actually get, you know, what be, how, so that you can align their research goals with this educational goal. 
And um, that's, that's difficult. I mean, I think we've been able to get, for example, this year we got a stimulus grant to support the, the iGEM kids. One thing, though, is that there are restrictions on that money. We can pay the stipends for the kids, but we're not allowed to pay um, for a, we have an education postdoc, but we're not allowed to pay their salary because that's seen as more administrative. However, that's absolutely essential for uh, you know, organizing the program and also lessening the burden on all of the, uh, the, the, these practicing scientists um, so that they can, uh, you know, it becomes easier for them to participate. Um, you had mentioned that your lab is now <coughs> working to continue the, the research in this synthetic so organelle. Organ okay. um, is it possible to come up with a model to show, and, and let's say that you hadn't had the iGEM people and somebody in your lab had come up with this idea. <coughs> My guess is that it would have been more expensive to start the idea with people making whatever your I mean, postdocs are not fabulous to pay, but I mean, there might be an economic model where there's actually a way to save money and forward research at the same time by using high school students as sort of an incubator of ideas. Has anybody looked at that so that it's not an yeah. extra cost, it's actually a cost savings right. in the long run? I mean, I think that's a great point is that, that, that um, uh, the, they, they are very skilled if they're trained properly. So, so you know, it's hard to say whether it's, it's, it's more efficient. It probably is equally efficient. I think where it really makes a difference is that this is the kind of project that if you're, say, a, a, a postdoctoral scientist who's looking out for your career and you're trying to think about what, you know, what papers you need and what you need to get a job, that tends to make you more conservative. And, and I think one of the things here is that these kids... And this program allows people to start thinking about more um, creative ideas, more innovative ones that are riskier. Um, so the risk is, in a sense, um, uh, more diversified. And so I think what, what would have happened in this case is it's less, far less likely that we would have started this kind of project without the preliminary results that the kids got from that first year. But it seems like if you could come up with a way... Uh, quantum, you know, some way of talking about savings or efficiency or something. I mean, people, that's what people are going to think about now, not, oh, we need to be competitive, you know, 20, 30 years from now. They need to figure out the money now. So it just seems like it might be something yeah. to try to finesse. To, to, to work out those numbers. One comment that I make, I was a faculty at the University of Michigan for several years, and I'm a physiologist, and I was a National Institute of um, Health fellow. So um, I appreciate very much what you've done. One of the things that universities do in the, in the sector where they're teaching science and actually research is they look for the best students. And what you have really got in that particular scenario that you gave us were very, very top students, whom I'm sure will all very, be very well successful. And we do need to compete in science. We are very, very lacking in science. And we are, there are parts of us who are working in the educational component outside of Congress to really try to work with the engineers and scientists. And we had the privilege at Michigan for having Dr. Francis Collins as a professor, but he was on loan to NIH. And so there are the universities such as MIT, Michigan, and, and, and San Francisco, and those institutions will be supported. And if you take a look at who is supported in this country, the ones that are in, in engineering and research and science are, are looked at as being absolutely vital to our survival. And I thank you for this today, because this is very enlightening. Thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned robotics competitions, and I was just curious how the barriers of entry compare, because for a robotics competition, you know, you, a couple thousand dollars worth of tools and materials, right, holders, <laughs> yeah. whereas I'm just curious, like, is there a significant difference in barrier of entry? Like, is this have, does this have the capability of reaching enough high schools or just a very select few that are able to reach it? It's kind of the cost. And um, uh, there's no doubt that this is um, much more expensive than... than uh, uh, the robotics competitions. Uh, but you know, one, one of the, the ideas behind synthetic biology is to, um, to essentially make the, the cost scales of doing biological research and, and doing genetic engineering, making them much, much more uh, uh, efficient. 
um, of, of making this, 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 this notion behind a philosophy behind synthetic biology of having a, a, a catalog of standard parts that will be freely available that people can use and mix and match in different ways uh, that approximates the kind of, uh, of, of, of structure that you have in electronics and mechanical engineering. Uh, so uh, I think we're not there yet, but that, that is sort of a direction that we're going towards. And, and things like DNA synthesis, crucial uh, tools for doing genetic engineering are getting much, much more cheap. Uh, so uh, that is certainly the tra trajectory. Um, the question of how applicable this is to um, you know, many different schools, I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, obviously, there aren't that many teachers out there like George Kachianis, who's a key uh, player here. Um, but you know, part of our hope is that it's not just necessarily doing the research, but uh, the ideas and the creativity. So, so w part of what we want to do with the curriculum, the teacher that are developing uh, curriculum, is to try to develop things that uh, material that allow the kids to think about biological systems not just in a descriptive way, um, where you sort of memorize all these different uh, parts of a cell or different species, but rather where you think about them in a functional and uh, way about how they're built to do certain functions and how they could be uh, manipulated. And I think that. Um, I think is a much better framework for engaging the kids and making them think about what, how a biological system works. So, oh, sorry, so you're moving towards developing a curriculum out of this that can be applied more universally, not like not a framework that can collapse, but like right. That's that's one of our goals. So you mentioned the integration of international students. So uh, you mentioned international students. Yeah. So, I was uh, wondering, what do you expect from this international collaboration and maybe competition itself? And how do you envision uh, further steps in promoting this kind of uh, international collaboration? And then I had another question uh, about the interdisciplinarity of the field. Symbio is at the convergence of different, different fields, engineering, biology. So, how do you promote this interdisciplinarity in the, uh, in the high school? Okay, so um, the two questions. The first one is uh, the, the international students and, and wh where do we see that going? Well, um, I mean, I think we just have the philosophy that science is an international endeavor uh, and that iGEM really represents that. And uh, it, I think it's a great, you know, I think we want to start that culture early on and have uh, the kids uh, see that there are other kids like them that have the same sort of interests and same in intense interests. Um, all around the world. And so we've also, in addition to having these kids come join our team, we've also sent some teams to uh, uh, Beijing, uh, some, some, some members to Beijing. And in fact, one of the students decided to actually, in, he's one of the first American students to actually enroll. He transferred from a UC to, to Peking University, which is, he's, he's kind of ahead of the curve. We'll see. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, so, but I think that, that uh, uh, you know, Progress in solving all of these challenges that I talked about early will have to come at an international level. And so whatever we can do to, to foster that, I think, is, is good. Uh, the question about uh, synthetic biology being at a, a sort of a convergence point for many different fields, not just biology, but engineering, uh, uh, physics, mathematics, computer science, uh, that's very true. And that's one of the, the great things and great challenges in modern science is that um, we are divided into these fields. And how do we bring people together? And how do we make them work as teams? And I think, um, again, the older scientists are sort of used to working the way that they work. And what we see here is that when we have this kind of format, bringing teams together, the kids don't have the egos that the, the adult scientists have. Um, and when we, we have these structures, like these team challenges, uh, that, uh, that, that you know, we pose a problem to a, to, to group sub teams and they try to come up with their own solutions. It's a really great way for bringing together kids that have different uh, backgrounds and ideas um, together. And so, actually, we've we've kind of expanded this. We've 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 started doing this with our postdocs and graduate students also. Um, and I think that is again one of the great challenges is how do we um, go from this sort of individual accomplishment model for science into one that um, is is more about efficient teams that work together that take the skills of, of different people and integrate them. So a bunch of high school kids hear about this and, and want to get involved. Uh, from your experience, what are the things that need to be put in place to enable that on a broader scale? Right. Okay, so 
uh, if, if you have a bunch of high school kids, uh, how do you enable them to, to do something like participate in an iGen team? I think um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I think uh, the, you know, pr- hopefully they would have a, uh, uh, some mentors within their school who would play a key role here in establishing links with a university or a biotech company. Uh, and, and I think that, that relationship, those sorts of partnerships, are really going to be the key for this. Just as an add on to that, is there anything that, that agencies like National Science Foundation could be doing to, to further enable that level of participation? <clears throat> I think so. I think that the, you know the this is obviously a relatively new program. I think that uh, um, uh, obviously f- uh, more funding to help support iGEM. I mean, iGEM is actually in a, in a stage where uh, it's grown almost too big for its own good, and um, uh, there are questions about is it time for it to split up so there's sub competitions on different continents and so on. Uh, and uh, as you move towards that, you move towards much kind of higher level organizations. So. We obviously need help with that. I think even though it would be you know, sad to, ha- to lose the intimacy of, of the current AJAM uh, competition, I think that if it does grow, it may also give more opportunities for your average school to participate at a, at a more modest level. Yes. I think this goes back to his question. Mm-hmm. Sort of like how many, how many more labs like yours would be willing to work with high school students like that? And how many more labs are there really available that could like, house teams right. like yours? Right. Well, I, I mean, I think there are a lot that could, and there are, um, but are there a lot that would see you know, the value in doing that? And I, you know, as I said, I must admit that I at first felt fairly put upon when someone said, I really want you to take this team over. And so I would be counted among those people. But uh, I mean, you know, part of what we're trying to do is to, to let people know uh, about what they can get out of this and how, and to incentivize um, other researchers to do this kind of thing. Let me ask you a sort of a follow-up question to that last part. What kind of what kind of uh, skills and knowledge do the high school students need? Like, are there entry level? Is there entry level knowledge base that you need to consider? Yeah. Well, that, I just want to bring up another point that that made me uh, uh, remember, which is that um, we, we talked a little bit about you know, scientific leaders uh, and developing those. But, but another point I want to make is that you know, there, there are a lot of kids going through this biotechnology program. Uh, and um, uh, there's another great need, which is not just to have the leaders, but also uh, in the coming decades, you know, many of us think that uh, biology and biological research is going to be a, a big part of our economy and that um, we need to have a, a, a larger workforce at many different levels that are competent in uh, working in the biological sciences. And so um, th- that is also, I think, an important part of this kind of program and the Lincoln program is that um, they, they are training people for, these, these, uh, for, for many different types of positions. And in fact, a lot of the students that, that, that we have, some of them um, you know, are, are going to community college. They're not necessarily the people who have done the best uh, in, uh, in you know gotten the best SAT scores and everything, um, they are you know there are community college programs where you spend two years at community college in a biotech program uh, and then go on to a UC, but that are sponsored in part by biotech companies. Um, so, uh, uh, but that gets to this point of what what are the basic skills? And the, these kids, um, at least in this two-year program, have become very comfortable with basic uh, recombinant DNA technology and manipulating. Um, DNA and, and thinking about these things, uh, and I think that's not something that's that hard to do. I think that's actually relatively uh, easy with um, fairly cheap equipment and um, the right teachers. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>